Hello, listeners. We want to let you know that we will be presenting at the Pennsylvania Society of Addiction Medicine annual meeting online on March 2nd. You can hear us speak and even see what we look like. After an extensively heated discussion, Sonia and I have picked the 10 articles that we reviewed which changed our practice the most. It's a little embarrassing, but we're going to put ourselves out there and tell you some of the things that we did wrong and how we changed our ways after reading these 10 articles. You can register for the conference at psam-asam.org. Hope to see you all there. This is Addiction Medicine Journal Club. I'm Dr. John Keenan. And I'm Dr. Sonia Del Tredici. We believe that addiction is a disease that can be treated, and we want to help you stay up to date with the latest research that you can use in your addiction medicine practice. This week, we are going to be discussing an article about the risks of developing opioid use disorder after a first opioid prescription. Before we get started, we wanted to just once again share some really exciting podcast news. We are now able to offer Category 1 CME for listening to this podcast through our new CME sponsor, MyCares, and Michigan State University. You can go to www.mycaresed.org to make an account, take a brief quiz, and get your credit. There will be a link in the show notes. Eventually, all of our episodes will be eligible for CME, and we will be rolling out CME credits for our previous episodes later on this summer. So stay tuned, and we're super excited about this for everyone. Yeah, we really are, and I love that we can offer CME credits, especially in the podcast format, so you can do it while you're exercising, driving, you know, wherever you want to listen to your podcasts. And it's for free. It is free. That is true. Sonia, are you ready to talk about our article? Yes, definitely ready. (laughs) So this is a great article, and I'm really happy that I chose it to do a deep dive into. The title is Risk Factors for the Development of Opioid Use Disorder After the First Opioid Prescription, a Swedish National Study. And it's just really great that they did this study because as well as presenting on substance use disorder, I also do a lot of lectures on safe opioid prescribing. I lecture to our residents about safe opioid prescribing and controlled substance prescribing overall. And one of the big risks of opioids is the development of opioid use disorder. And this paper really gets to what actually is that risk because it turns out to be a difficult question to answer. So a little bit of background. Between 10 and 20 years ago, opioid prescribing by providers, physicians, and nurse practitioners, physician assistants, was blamed for the surge in opiate use disorder and overdose deaths. And there is no doubt that excessive prescribing, especially in the United States, was what got many people started down their road to opioid use disorder. When this excessive prescribing was recognized, regulations were put in place to control opioid prescribing, and we have significantly reduced our opioid prescribing over the past 10 years. The death rate from prescribed opioids has remained stable after rising. Initially, it's remained stable for about the last 10 years. But overall, opioid overdose deaths, as we know, continue to rise and are just a devastating epidemic in our country. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to an article from JAMA about opioid prescribing, and it has some really good graphs showing opioid prescribing rates on the same graph as opioid overdose deaths over time. And you can see how prescribing goes down and deaths go up. Many studies have tried to estimate the risk of developing opiate use disorder after a prescription for opioids, but the answer is not clear as to what that risk is because the landscape of illicit opiate use has changed significantly and the majority of opioid overdose deaths now are caused by fentanyl and its analogs, not by the prescribed oxycontin, oxycodone that people used to take. So when I talk to patients about the risks and benefits of opioid therapy, I would like to be able to tell them what the true risk is of developing an opioid use disorder. When I talk to patients about the risks and benefits of opioid therapy, I would like to be able to tell them what the true risk of developing an opioid use disorder is, since that's one of the most feared complications of prescription opioid therapy. This study aims to provide some modern data on this question. Is there a connection between the receipt of a prescription opioid and the development of opioid use disorder. So that's what this study is really trying to get at. So John, before we get into this article, what do you tell your patients about the risks of developing an opioid use disorder when you're considering prescribing opioids? Like if you give someone a prescription for six oxycodone, if they have a kidney stone, do you tell them that this could lead to opioid use disorder? Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting question. I think for chronic pain management, those are very extensive discussions that I have with patients regarding all the head to toe risks of 
chronic opioid use, especially kind of risk of, of addiction. I'll be honest, I think that, you know, there, there's a growing amount of literature about kind of alternatives for acute pain management. And I'm not a surgeon. So not being a surgeon and knowing that there's other alternatives, I feel like I'm prescribed less and less opioids for these short durations. However, I'll be honest with you, the few that I do, I, I'm going to put myself out there. I don't think I have a substantial counseling about that this three-day prescription for their kidney stone could increase their risk of opioid dependence. Do you? You know, for long-term prescribing, yes, I do. For shorter-term prescribing, sometimes it kind of depends on the situation. You know, I often have patients requesting opioids for short-term use, and I will steer them towards something else, and they'll say, why? And I'll say, well, there's risk to opioids. And depending on the patient, I may or may not say one of the risks is it makes you more likely to develop opioid use disorder in the future. But it's not I don't have a standard counseling about the risks of short-term opioids for patients. I think if I want to kind of speak for healthcare in general, I don't think that we probably as a whole do that that often. No, I don't think we do great risk and benefit discussions that often overall. You know, our MO is patients come to us with a problem. They say, I've got this problem. We say, hey, take this medicine. And we don't necessarily delve into like a whole big risks versus benefits question. You know, the patients sort of trust us to assess the risks and benefits, choose the thing that works the best and not make them have to learn all the risks and all the benefits and make the choice for themselves. Like that's why they're coming to the doctor in the first place. They want us to know those and to tell them what would be the best. So I think we don't necessarily involve the patient in that discussion very much. Yeah, it's interesting. I've seen um, some commentary recently about kind of the term, like, you know, risk benefits. Like, you know, we, we probably shouldn't be using that term. It should really be like harm benefits because it kind of assumes a possible, a possibility versus a definitive improvement. So it's, you're right. It's something that I think we could probably all improve quite a bit. So I'm going to talk more about this study. So it was very complicated and they asked five separate questions in this study, but the five questions are related and they all try to elaborate the connection between an opioid prescription and the risk for subsequent opioid use disorder. So question one, which to me was the main outcome of this paper is how much does receipt of an opioid prescription increase risk for subsequent opioid use disorder? So this is a single first opioid prescription. How much does that increase your risk for subsequent opioid use disorder? That's question one. Question two is they explored risk factors assessed at the time of opioid prescription that might predict development of opiate use disorder. So saying who might go on to develop opioid use disorder. Third, determine whether the duration of that initial opioid prescription alters the risk for subsequent opioid use disorder. So basically does getting more opioids lead to more opioid use disorder, kind of a dose response result. Question four. They did a bunch of statistical tests. They did propensity score matching and a co-sibling analysis looking at siblings to try to get some insight into the causal nature of the association between their predictors and the opiate use disorder risk. So they just tried to estimate, did our predictors and did this opioid prescription actually cause the opioid use disorder rather than just be associated with it? And finally, they tried to develop a risk score for opioid use disorder onset after an opioid prescription and then try to evaluate its performance. So actually get a score that you could use to say, hey, does this person here I'm going to give opioids to, do they have a high risk of opioid use disorder? So I should avoid opioids in this person. So those are the five questions. And again, they all explore the connection between receipt of a first opioid prescription and the development of opioid use disorder. So who was in this study? This was done in Sweden. Everyone in the study was Swedish. They were born between 1980 and 2000, so people in their 20s, 30s, from multiple Swedish national health databases without a registration of opioid use disorder prior to 2007. So Swedes without opioid use disorder. They were followed until they got a diagnosis of opioid use disorder or death, emigration, so they left Sweden and left the database, or end of the study follow-up, whichever came first. I learned that Sweden has a lot of different health databases, so many databases to track its population, including a really interesting database called the Swedish Suspicion Register, which contains data on people strongly suspected of crimes. And that data was also included in this study. The demographics, it was 51.7% male, so a little more than half male, born between 1980 and 2000, like I said, so, you know, 23 to 43. 25% had received a first opioid prescription. 
94% were Swedish born and 7% had a prior history of drug use disorder. 3% had a previous diagnosis of alcohol use disorder and 24% had a previous pain diagnosis. The harmful event was the sort of event or the, the factor we're looking at. I call it harmful event because this is a study of harm is the first opioid prescription. It was compared to not having an opioid prescription, and the outcome was the development of opioid use disorder and the risk factors associated with the development of opioid use disorder. So before we go on, John, what did you think of the clinical question here? I think it was really interesting. I think that that these are all kind of really valid questions. I like how they stratify these groups to try to look, like kind of subdivide into what actually is the possible area of harm here. I don't know. I think it was really cool. Yeah, it was a good question. As I said, they asked like five separate questions, but they're all connected. So they all, each question kind of gave more insight into the big topic of this paper. So let's talk about validity. I thought this was a valid trial and I want to talk about some strengths. One, it was very large, 1.5 plus million people in the database. Most patients had complete data for analysis because apparently in Sweden, they're very good at collecting data. The outcomes were clinically relevant. I would have liked to see overdose deaths as well, mortality outcome, not just development of opioid use disorder, but that's a very relevant outcome. The follow-up was long enough to be clinically relevant. They did a ton of statistics to try to figure out the associations and eliminate confounders. They did a full multivariate modeling. They did propensity score matching, this co-sibling analysis looking at siblings. They did predictive modeling. I'm not going to spend too much time on this since I don't think I really have the knowledge or complete grasp of it to explain it adequately. Also, because this is just an audio program, I find it a little hard to listen to this kind of technical explanations um, without being able to read them or look at something written down. But the paper was pretty clear, and I definitely recommend that anyone who wants to know more about some of these modeling that they did should read it. The association is biologically plausible. So in this sample, the exposure preceded the onset of the outcome. There was a dose response gradient seen looking for patients who receive more opioid prescriptions, having a higher risk of opioid use disorder. And this is an association that's been found in other studies. So it does make biologic sense that this association would exist. Finally, funding. It was funded by the NIH, NIDA, and the Swedish Research Council. So I think that was unlikely to cause bias. There were a few weaknesses of this study, a few things that the authors noted and I also noted that maybe limited the conclusions a little bit. So the first one is that the data set did not include specific information regarding the content of that opioid prescription. So what was the medicine? What was the dose? What was the duration? We don't have that information. They also got their prevalence of substance use disorder and mental health disorders from large databases, which may not be accurate. And this is just me. I really feel like this might've been in the paper and I didn't understand it or didn't see it. But I couldn't tell if the patients who received the opioid prescription were similar at baseline to patients who did not receive an initial opioid prescription. So I don't know. I just felt like it's possible that the people who got that opioid prescription were somehow different or somehow had a tendency to develop opioid use disorder in a way, like people who maybe had more chronic pain or had more life events that led to chronic pain and required an opiate prescription. Um, There was no data comparing them to the people who hadn't got the opioid prescription. So to me, that was a weakness. If the authors are listening, Dr. Kenneth Kendler at VCU, we're very interested in that comparison. So if you want to tell me where to find it in the paper, I would appreciate it. Because I really think it's possible that he answered this question in one of the statistical models, and I just couldn't really understand it. Another potential weakness is that prescribers may not have prescribed opioids to all groups equally. That's kind of connected to my previous point, thus biasing the exposure. And it was not blinded. And again, just a little heavy on the statistical modeling. It's hard for me to evaluate. I feel like I can understand it okay, but I can't really say whether it was done right or not. Um, The authors did their best to explain it clearly, but I guess this is a little more my own personal weakness, not really a weakness of the study. So John, did you think this was a valid study? Yeah, I think it was seemed pretty valid from what you described. So certainly kind of large database. I, I think it's interesting you point out kind of like the bias about kind of people might be less likely to receive them that were probably higher risk. So that's interesting that it's kind of a bias almost against what it's looking to prove. But yeah, it certainly seems like they've got good follow-up, good databases. I mean, it sounds like Sweden has quite a bit of, um, you know, a robust kind of uh, population data to analyze here. So very interesting. All right. So we think it's a valid trial. Let's talk about the results. And I'm going to talk about the results to each of these five questions that they asked. And I'll try to keep it understandable in my explanations. So question one, 
how much does receipt of an opioid prescription increase risk for subsequent opioid use disorder? So 24.8% of people in the study received a first opioid prescription. Of those, 0.9% developed a new opioid use disorder. So of course, those prescriptions didn't cause that opioid use disorder necessarily. But so 25% more or less received first opioid prescription, a little less than 1% developed a new opioid use disorder. The hazard ratio for opioid use disorder after that opioid prescription was 7.1 with a 95% confidence interval of 6.75 to 7.46. So a pretty tight confidence interval and a mean time of onset of the opioid use disorder of 3.41 years. The opioid renewal was associated with a hazard ratio of 3.66 for opioid use disorder, and the risk for opioid use disorder over the first one, two, and five years after the first opioid prescription equaled 0.17, 0.32, and 0.68 respectively. So the longer time went after that initial prescription, the more likely you were to develop that opioid use disorder. And so since this is the primary outcome, I do want to linger just a little bit on these numbers. This association is really large with a hazard ratio of greater than 7, of 7.1, much larger than seen in previous studies. The authors did feel that the absolute risk of developing an opiate use disorder was sort of low, but I don't really agree. You know, this is a life-altering disease and having a 0.9% chance of developing it after you get your first opiate prescription to me seems pretty high. You know, if we assume that all of that opiate use disorder is from the first opiate prescription, that's a number needed to harm of 111. I mean, that's a big assumption. That's probably not true at all. It's a little hard to say that a limited prescription for low-dose opioids is responsible for the development of an opioid use disorder five years later, but it might be. You know, it might do something to your neurons in your brain that really puts you down the path to developing an opioid use disorder. So again, in this primary outcome, there was a very strong association between the receipt of an opioid prescription, and the development of an opioid use disorder later in life, within five years. So that's thing one. Question two, which was to explore using univariate and multivariable analysis, a wide range of risk factors assessed at the time of that opioid prescription that might predict development of opioid use disorder. So what factors, what characteristics of the patients would be associated with opioid use disorder. So you won't be surprised at all that the five strongest multivariable predictors were, in order, prior drug use disorder. So if you already had substance use disorder, you were more likely to develop it. Prior depression and anxiety disorders, prior criminal behavior, prior alcohol use disorder, and male sex. So those are the five strongest predictors. Prior drug use disorder, depression, anxiety, criminal behavior, alcohol use disorder, and male sex. So I'm not super surprised by those predictive variables. One very interesting thing they found was that genetic risk had a relatively modest impact, much less than things like divorce, whether your parents were divorced, or even education level. And I wonder if this has to do with the underlying Swedish population, which is relatively genetically homogenous, maybe compared to the United States population where we have a more diverse group, maybe a more diverse genetic makeup. Because I feel like in my practice, I see a lot of just a you know gut feeling, but genetic component to substance use disorder. Pretty much all my patients have a strong, strong family history of substance use disorder. I have very few who don't have a strong family history of substance use disorder. So that was something that did not kind of match my personal experience. So third question Determine whether the duration of the opioid prescription alters the risk for subsequent opioid use disorder. And the answer is yes. Longer initial opioid therapy was associated with a greater risk. And to be specific, the renewal of the opioid prescription, that initial opioid prescription, within six months was associated with future opioid use disorder with a hazard ratio of 3.66 and a pretty tight confidence interval, 3.41 to 3.93. And that impact is over and above the sevenfold increased risk for opioid use disorder from the first opioid prescription. Now, Son, you may have said this already, but I know that kind of this studies over a pretty long period of time, kind of standard of care for like opioid prescriptions has really changed, um, substantially decreased in terms of duration. How long were these scripts that they were talking about to be renewed? We don't know. And so, yeah, it's a big missing piece of information. You might wonder why we don't know that. And, um, We don't know what was in the prescription and how long it was for, just that it was a single initial prescription for opioids. Could have been morphine, oxycodone, dilaudid, who knows, and it could have been for any length of time. And and I don't know the opioid prescribing standards in Sweden, unfortunately, so I actually can't tell 
what would have been in those initial scripts. Because that's my only thought about this is kind of like, you know, sometimes it is, it's sort of like the pre and post fentanyl era. I think that kind of it's like the pre and post prescribing it over a relatively short period of time. You know, we've transitioned over to this kind of standard of care of three, three days of, of post-op opioids. And, you know, a lot of the surgeons will say that five, six, seven years ago, it wasn't uncommon to give someone 60, 70 tablets of a narcotic in a post-op period. Right. Now you get like three. Yeah. So question four, they did these analyses to gain insight into the causal nature of the association between their predictors and the opiate use disorder risk. So they did a bunch of models. I'm just going to put it all together. They summarized that the models indicated that approximately a third of the association was causal. So about a third of the people who developed opioid use disorder after their initial opiate prescription was from that prescription itself and not from something else. And that would increase the number needed to harm for the first opioid prescription to about 333, which is still kind of a lot as far as I'm concerned. And finally, they created and tested a risk score for opioid use disorder onset after opioid prescribing. So in their model, the sensitivity was okay, but specificity was very low. And this means that the model can flag most of the people who will ultimately develop an opioid use disorder. So it's very sensitive. If you're going to develop an opioid use disorder, this model will pick you out. But it also gave a high score to many people who will never develop an opioid use disorder. So it was not very specific. It caught a lot of people who will never develop an opioid use disorder. And in our live journal club, we had a really interesting discussion about these kinds of predictive models because St. Max's has considered using these kinds of scores in the past. So if you were to be faced with opioid prescribing, the computer would feed you a score saying this is this person's risk of developing opioid use disorder. Do you want to reconsider the prescription? Do you want to have a risk-benefit discussion with them? And we had thought that these scores were kind of problematic, both because of their lack of specificity and also the fact that they're based on underlying chart data, which may be inaccurate. And finally, just because these models are hard to understand and we didn't want to introduce sort of artificial bias into that prescribing decision. So we hadn't used these models in the past, but maybe in the future, it's something we will get to use. So John, in the end, what did you think of the results? Um, I thought that was somewhat surprising that kind of how powerful kind of a brief prescription here was. I mean, you're right. That's a relatively high number needed to treat, but we still, these are prescribed in mass and kind of extrapolating what they're talking about here. You know, talking about any opioid prescription, not just these prolonged cases. I think it it's something to think about because we read a lot more of these brief scripts than we do put people on chronic opioids. Yeah, for sure. I mean, to me, the results were so surprising. And the authors did admit that their association was a lot bigger, a lot more robust than other similar studies in the past. So their association was really strong. So let's talk about how we might use these results. So I personally would be using this data in the context of prescribing opioids for the first time to someone. So I got someone with a pain diagnosis. I think they might need opioids. I'm going to prescribe them. That's where I would use this data. My patients are pretty different from those in this study. Rates of opioid prescribing in Sweden are less than in the U.S. In Sweden, 80% of people are Swedish. Uh, in York, Pennsylvania, like none of my patients are Swedish. The social safety net landscape is vastly different there. Um, so getting diagnosed and then treated for a substance use disorder is probably pretty different in Sweden. So it just makes it a little harder to extrapolate these results to my population in Pennsylvania. And then look at the risks and benefits. So the risks were the development of opiate use disorder, which is definitely something my patients would be very interested in. They didn't discuss other harms of opioid prescribing, so you can't use this paper for a full risk-benefit discussion of opioid prescribing. They didn't talk about temporary adverse effects like constipation, and they didn't talk about overdose deaths. So they didn't really discuss all the risks. And of course, they didn't discuss the benefits of the opioid prescription, which would presumably be pain control. But even that is considered to be of questionable benefit in both studies of short and long-term opioids. So I can't even say if benefits outweigh the harms. This paper doesn't really give me that information, but it does elucidate one of the risks, which is development of opiate use disorder with a number needed to harm that I personally calculated at 333. So of a single opioid prescription, one in 333 people will develop opioid use disorder. I looked up some of the social media conversations about this article. You know, when I was researching, I kind of Googled the article and see what people have been saying about it. And a lot of people on social media felt like this was a very low risk, that this article actually proved that prescribing opioids is very safe. And to me, that was not the case at all. Like opioid use disorder is a life-changing and potentially fatal disease. And if we give it to one in 333 people, 
who receive a prescription opiate, like that's not good. What if they cause, you know, breast cancer in one in 300 women or some other life-threatening treatable, but potentially life-threatening disease, um, especially something that's prescribed in mass, both to young and old people. Um, to me, this seemed kind of high. So I don't know. I don't know if the FDA has a threshold, like how many people can you harm with your drug before we can't approve it? But I bet it's more than one in 333. I think sometimes when I hear stuff like that, I kind of like reverse engineer the argument a little bit. So let's kind of take out opioid use disorder. If we had another condition that the adverse effect rate that's serious, life-changing, it was a number needed to harm was that high for something that could be life-altering, would we proceed with caution? You know, I, I can think of just recently reading, uh, went through the residents, they were talking about HLA typing before allopurinol starting, start for s- select patients of certain ethnicities to decrease risk of like a life-threatening condition, right? So I think that we already do this with other diseases. I think that, you know, this kind of adds like a growing body of questions about how do we kind of narrow what the group that could actually we harm here. And I think we still don't know that, right? But I think that is a pretty high number and we already do it for other diseases with much higher number needed to harms when it's serious, life-threatening and life-altering. Well, and the problem is these predictive models. So we can't predict with any real certainty who is going to go on to develop opioid use disorder. And the predictive models are not only not necessarily as sensitive or specific as we want, but they're use these factors that are just so prone to bias. So saying that we're not going to give someone opioid pain control because they have a history of criminal behavior, like that just doesn't feel right to me. You know, even though that is a strong correlate to opiate use disorder, to say that it's people who've been in jail in the past won't get the same medical treatment from me as someone who has not been in jail. Like that's a direct violation of, you know, sort of AMA code of ethics. Or saying that people who have anxiety and depression shouldn't get prescription opioids if they get their wisdom teeth out. You know, it's almost like, what's the connection here? Um, And there is a connection. That's what this study shows, but it doesn't feel right to change your treatment based on these risk factors for opiate use disorder compared to something like having HLA B27 genotype, which is not sort of a stigmatized factor about the patient. So it feels very uncomfortable to deploy these risk models in actual clinical practice, at least to me. And I've never personally I've thought about them, but I don't think I've used them. I try to be very consistent in my opioid prescribing and have the same standards for everybody. Is that just in reference to acute or chronic pain? Kind of all of it. So, you know, I, I definitely worry about it. And I do worry about the development of opiate use disorder. You know, one of my children received opioids for the first time after a uh, surgical procedure, and I was pretty um, anxious about that. But, you know, smooth sailing all the way. Well, thanks for presenting that article, Sonia. That was very interesting. Well, I feel lucky that I chose it and I definitely will be thinking about it as I move forward. And I'm going to be, I already integrated it into a lecture I'm giving to the residents on safe opioid prescribing in about two weeks. So I'm glad I read it too. So we have some talk back from our previous episodes. So we got a comment on Spotify from Chris and Van Zandt regarding episode 24 on smoking cessation. She said, thank you for another amazing and inspirational podcast. Tobacco recovery is especially important in PCP, behavioral health, and substance use disorder programs. People appreciate it. Thank you for the uh, the kind words and positive feedback. And John, we also got two questions on Twitter regarding episode 25 uh, about high-dose buprenorphine induction, which has been super popular, by the way. Everybody loved that episode. So thank you for doing that article. And since this was your article to present, I want to read those questions to you and see what you think about it. So the first was from a Dr. Daniel Oram, and he asked, so here's a question. I would have thought high-dose induction refers to high initial buprenorphine dose to decrease risk of precipitated withdrawal as opposed to total induction dose. It seems the protocol doesn't address this at all. So what do you think, John, about initial super high dose as opposed to the protocol in that episode, which was like four or eight initially, and then a higher dose afterwards? Yeah. So I think that uh, that's a great question. That's probably the next area to really look at with this kind of topic. 
but certainly, uh, you know, the study, when they kind of said high initial dose, they were talking about going beyond the current guidelines of the eight to 12 milligrams on the first 24 hours. So it was a higher day one initial dose, but you're right. It wasn't going straight out the gate to 24 milligrams of a person walking through the emergency room, which I think I'm sure they're going to look at something like that based upon how low the rates of precipitated withdrawal were within the study at some point, or someone's probably already doing it. Yeah, I'm sure there's someone out there doing it, especially people who want to do sort of a rapid induction, just get it over with quickly. I think we've talked offline about this before, Sonia, but I think we often kind of like our fear of precipitate withdrawal, we often kind of start low and with like, you know, two to eight milligrams, which is like the worst dose for precipitated withdrawal, right? I think if you go beyond that, you typically kind of treat the precipitated withdrawal um, and kind of just treat through it. But that's like the sweet spot to like put them into it, but also make them and keep them miserable. Yes, I did hear about that. I did hear some people say that. And speaking of, our next question from Dr. Anthony Accurso, he asked, I he said, I'm perplexed because in our inpatient withdrawal management setting, precip is the norm with bup challenge at any dose. So he's saying he gets a ton of precipitated withdrawal in his inpatient withdrawal management program. Noting a big potential co-founder, here many of the patients from the ED may have been naloxone treated in the field by EMS. His patients in detox have not been treated by naloxone. So do you think that that could be related and why I'm wondering he would have so much precipitated withdrawal in his inpatient uh, withdrawal management where uh, it was not seen in this study in the ER? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, certainly, you would think that compared to an inpatient detox unit, you're probably right. They probably have been treated more likely with naloxone, although this study was really kind of any patient with opioid use to sort of walk into the ER. So this was not just patients that were um, kind of overdose responses, right? So these were also people with medical conditions that warranted admission and kind of opioid use disorder was kind of an additional treatment complication that they had to address. So I think it's a valid point, but I think that the study was more inclusive than just kind of patients that were overdose responses already kind of naloxone challenged. Well, and I will say actually in this paper, they excluded patients who had received naloxone in the field because they were then categorized as complicated opioid withdrawal and they got like a specialty consult. So they, in this study, they only looked at uncomplicated opiate withdrawal, which actually would be probably more similar to what Dr. Crusoe is seeing in his inpatient withdrawal management program. Great point. Yeah. The one thing I thought of when I saw his comment was that people I've talked to have said it can be hard to know actually what is precipitated withdrawal. And sometimes it's just regular withdrawal, not precipitated withdrawal. The, with, you didn't give enough buprenorphine and the patient's opiate withdrawal is just continuing the way it was going to anyway. And so the patient might interpret it as precipitated withdrawal, but it's not. It's just regular withdrawal. So, and it can be really hard to tell the two apart. Yeah. I feel like the, the toughest thing is when you have someone with a home induction and then they keep taking a small dose and they say they're in precipitated withdrawal and then they kind of abandon and you restart again. And I feel like you can have six or seven kind of these episodes of discomfort and you don't really know what guidance you should give them, but they're afraid. Well, right. I mean, going through episodes of withdrawal poisons people's minds against, you know, everything, buprenorphine against treatment against against trying to get off opioids it's really unpleasant um yeah the only precipitated withdrawal i've really had to struggle with with my patients is people coming off methadone haven't had too much trouble with other substances but methadone seems to be difficult well thanks for those uh comments and keep them coming we certainly love hearing what people have to say Thank you for listening to the Addiction Medicine Journal Club. The best part of any journal club is a conversation, and we want to hear what you have to say. To have your opinions about the articles included in a future episode, send us your comments on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, email, or join us on Facebook. The links are in the show notes. Original theme music was composed and performed by Benjamin Kennedy. Audio editing by Aaron McHugh. Production by Dr. Patrick Beeman and Ars Longa Media. Addiction Medicine Journal Club is intended for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. The views here are expressed are our own and do not necessarily reflect those of our employers or the authors of the articles we review. All patient information has been modified to protect their identities. Thank you for being part of the conversation and have a great day.